We'll be talking about groups and identity, new opportunities and new problems, question mark. Um, and many of us social scientists do work um, that puts people or phenomena into categories of some kind, whether that be cultural groups, age groups, sexual identity, race, class, et cetera. Um, even psychological disorders, as we talked about um, a couple of weeks ago. And all of us can also, of course, seriously critique the, these categories that we use, arguing for a much more fluid or dimensional kind of lens, especially when we consider nuanced issues such as um, people belonging to multiple groups, having multiple identities, how identities change over time, and the distinction between how we perceive our own group identities and how we may be perceived and treated by others. So many question whether these categorical groupings are of any use at all, especially when we consider that there's often um, more diversity within groups than there is between groups. But interestingly, when we t we're talking about this, much of the civil rights and social movements of the last 50 years have been very focused on establishing a strong and positive group identity. In fact, establishing and internalizing this, this strong group identity has been seen in some ways as a political prerequisite for really resisting oppression and for organizing, you know, so that, that you really, it's, it's important for people, you know, as part of these organizing efforts to sort of have a sense of identity in the group and also see where your group fits in, in terms of the power hierarchy. Um, and we see this process today to some extent in the Occupy Wall Street movement with the naming of 99% and 1% of people identifying in this sort of new set of categories. There's also been a really significant pushback in recent decades. Arguments that have focused on group identity is very splintering and actually gets in the way of alliances and sort of larger struggles for more equitable society. So we're taking this on <laughs> in our brief uh, five minute increments um, from our varying disciplinary perspectives. So me as a psychologist, um, uh, two sociologists and an economist, and we'll all introduce ourselves at our time. We're going to provide different takes on groups and group identity and their pros and cons, and we'll also consider more broadly, um, in the time permitting, how our work with groups relates to power and the challenges we face in doing this work. So Tyrone's going to start us off. Great. Uh, Tyrone Foreman, sociologist from Emory University. Um, so echoing some of the comments by Emily, uh, there's a general philosophy in the context of studying racial categories that preserving uh, or um, reinforcing racial boundaries through classification is negative, uh, promotes separatism or division. And there are two instances in which this has really uh, crystallized itself. One is here in the state of California in October 7th of 2003, there was an initiative called Proposition 54, which was called the Racial Privacy Initiative. And that initiative had at its core the banning of classification by government uh, entities by race and skin color. The belief was that it, by um, forcing individuals in the state of California to put their race or skin color on the state form in some ways led to division or further exacerbated racial inequality. The other context in which this thinking or this general philosophy was at play is in this nation, Brazil. Brazil is a country in some ways very unique and different from the United States in that it is a country that has not collected racial data uh, in a systematic fashion over a long period of time. The result, one would believe, based on the general philosophy that I sort of just described earlier, is that black-white inequality in a place like Brazil would be much less than in the United States. In point of fact, that is not the case. Black-white inequality in Brazil is much starker than it is here in the United States. The question then becomes, why is that the case? Um, and in fact, as an anecdote, um, Brazil currently has a very aggressive affirmative action program, more aggressive than ours, in trying to improve the conditions for black Brazilians. What I think these two cases highlight is a fundamental challenge that we're faced with as social scientists, but also the public, both here in the United States, but I think globally. 
That is, it's very difficult to solve problems that one refuses to acknowledge. And, but at the same time, these ideas about wanting to get rid of racial classification are not without merit. That is, some of the important work by anthropologists, for example, the classic statement by Ashley Montague, they really talked about the impreciseness of racial categories, that there was no scientific validity to them, really highlighted that this category that many people have used uh, in forms of analysis is troubling. Um, and it's troubling not just because it's imprecise, but also because of what Emily highlighted in terms of the fluidity of the category, right? The growing multiracial movement in the United States where people have checked off in the last two decennial censuses, multiple uh, racial classifications, highlights the trouble or the tensions for that social scientists face in trying to understand uh, any inequity using such an imprecise category. And at the same time, what it has also produced is what many have talked about as the post-racial predicament. Mm -hmm. uh, and that post-racial predicament uh, has been articulated well by the historian David Hollinger, a, a historian at uh, Berkeley. And he argues that, and I quote him here, it's a future in which ethno-racial categories central to identity politics would be more matters of choice than inscription, in which mobilization by ethno-racial groups would be more strategic option than a presumed destiny attendant upon mere membership in a group, end quote. So post-racialism, that is the belief that racial equality has been achieved and that race is not a key organizing feature of society, is becoming a central issue uh, in study among academics. But it's not just academics who are interested in this. A survey in 2000 of blacks and whites in which they were asked in a nationwide survey the following question, do you think that blacks have achieved racial equality? Or will, um, the responses were that fully one third of whites in 2000 said that racial equality had been achieved. 6% of African Americans had said racial equality had been achieved. Fast forward to the winter of 2009 or early part of 2009 after the election of Barack Obama, the same question was asked of blacks and whites. Now two thirds of whites said racial equality had been achieved and 17% of African Americans. And so I'm not struck by the racial difference. This has been something that's occurred for uh, for in many years among in public opinion research, but I'm interested in that growing trend, a tr almost tripling among African Americans and a doubling among whites in a belief that we've achieved racial equality. Now what's to be done? Is race, racial categories uh, antiquated? Should social scientists move beyond such racial categories as a category of analysis in contemporary and historical context? I don't believe that's the case. I think that we need to develop new frameworks that allow us to register the reality of racial progress in our society without ignoring the enduring racial inequities that still exist. And that really is the challenge that social scientists are confronted with and one of the things that I am trying to do in my work uh, and in the Q&A I can talk more specifically about how I attempt to do that. <laughs> 